Just Right Snowboard channel, I'm Lars Horstman and in today's episode I would like to share with you a few concepts and approaches to finding the right board length for your particular riding style. In 11 years of snowboard retail I've had a particular conversation multiple times with different people because length is quite a touchy subject for some and uh, that would go roughly like this. The board has been found, I'm going for this one and then what length does it come in? And I'd be like, oh, it's a 157 or 160 for you, I guess. And the person would go, ah, oh, nah, man, I'm a 158 or 159, that's my sweet spot. And uh, if you're one of those people who are so dead set in a particular length, then I am very much hoping that I can invite you here today to, to keep listening to this episode and the things that I have to say about board design all the things that um, have influence on how you perceive length and maybe uh, by the end of this talk you will be inspired to try something new and potentially tap into some experiences on snow that you have not had so far. First thing we got to ask ourselves is like who is actually asking the question? Uh, are you someone who rides seven days a year and you are forced to buy that one board quiver because you can't justify spending more money than, than simply owning one snowboard? Or are you a person who is building a quiver because you get to ride a ton and you are, you are done with this one board quiver thing? You've realized that a park board has a certain flex and needs a different length than a carving board. And then there's a power board in between that you know could be a short fat like this one. Or it could also be like a standard power shape that is a bit more free ridey and maybe even a bit longer. So there are so many, there are so many different uh, angles and aspects to finding the right length. Um, the most important thing with this is actually figuring out which kind of uh, aspects of board design contribute to um, the way you perceive length. And that's something we're going to look at right now. Now before we can go any further than this and you guys start sending me all these comments on my shirt, well this is not a skier my friends, this is the Yeti obviously and he is out on a, a splitboard trip in Revelstoke with Joey Vosberg and being the legend he is, Joey is obviously teaching him how to split ski. Now that we have that out of the way, we can continue. So I'll be treating this entire subject a little bit more from like a riding the mountain perspective, as in turning, riding powder, carving, uh, rather than from a freestyle standpoint. I think, um, and with freestyle, I don't mean like backcountry freestyle, like sending big cliffs. I'm talking park. I'm talking uh, maybe slope style, like um, butter tricks, rails, uh, hitting like park jumps. Um, and it's pretty obvious, I think, that a shorter board in that scenario um, obviously spins quicker, is easier to butter because you have your weight closer to the tips, um, and is simply nimbler and more agile. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, what I want to talk about here in particular is the perceived length of a board as you ride it, as you turn it in various conditions. You might be surprised to hear this, but there's actually no standard way of measuring snowboard length. So some manufacturers would go uh, and basically stand the board onto its tail and measure straight up from the ground to the very tip, to the very nose, and that's the length. Now, as soon as you include the curve of tip and tail, you get a different length. The board's going to be longer, right? So since we never really know how a given manufacturer has measured, um, you might be surprised what you all find when you start measuring your boards in different ways. So your 160, when you uh, measure um, tip to tail in a straight line, might actually only be a 158. Uh, so to me, that is already the first reason why I don't want to get too hung up on um, having that perfect length, as in that one number that I'm so familiar with. What you perceive the most as the length of the board is obviously the surface of the board that actually touches the snow. And that can be quite different 
um, depending on whether you are talking about the flat base uh, contact or the contact the board has when you tip it over on edge. So um, in K2's archives, uh, I found these two images here of uh, the K2 Ultra Dream and the K2 Carver. Those boards are discontinued. Uh, they were actually pretty cool boards. And those two examples explain insanely well what I'm talking about. So when you are looking at the K2 Ultra Dream, this board is, uh, was meant to be basically a backcountry freestyle board. They wanted it to float really well in powder, so they gave it uh, very large tips. And what I mean with tips is the amount of board um, past the contact point. So this is, your, this is where your effective edge ends, right? Like um, this part of your edge is no longer in the snow when you're actually doing a carved turn. Um, so that's the end of your effective edge. And I'm talking all the board from here on into the very tip on that Ultra Dream, huge. Um, what that means is you have a, a relatively short effective edge, right? So that board on a 1 meter 64 overall uh, board had an effective edge from only 1 meter 16 and a little bit. So that, there's a bit of an aver average here that I'm going to use as a reference. This is not 100% accurate, um, but that's it's kind of a, a pretty good um, formula to go by. The effective edge of your average shape that isn't uh, trying to be any very specific niche board, like a carving board or powder board, um, is about three quarters of its stated length. So if you have a board that is one meter 60 long, you can expect the edge to be around 120 unless the manufacturer tried something, you know, out of the box or, or wanted to achieve something uh, particularly different. So on this uh, Ultra Dream, K2 did want to achieve something different. And you can also see that in the, uh, the camber profile. This board was a flat board, so there's no camber, it's just flat between the feet. And then it did have early rise tip and tail. Now, when this thing is on the flat base um, and you measure what actually touches, let's say, a table, like in my case here, you would have found that this contact length is insanely small. Like for 164, uh, I, I, I never measured, but like there was a lot of tip and tail rocker going on on that board. So what that means is at low edge angles, the board pivots super easily and you would perceive it as a really short board because the tips aren't touching the snow. Um, and that section is also flat. There's no camber that you're fighting or compressing. And, um, and uh, uh, the shortness and the flatness make for like a swivelly, pivoty kind of feel, right? So as soon as you tip this board on edge, obviously that increases, right? Like your surface is then like if you properly tip it over, one meter 16 as stated on the spec sheet here, um, which for 164 is very, very short. So like with my formula of like uh, three quarters of the board uh, should be effective edge, um, you would expect this thing to have more like a, I don't know, probably around a one meter 23 ish um, effective edge. Now, when you put that thing into powder, you get the full benefit of the one meter 64, including those giant scoops in the tip and tail. So this board, they kind of nailed it because it was supposed to be backcountry freestyle, right? So you have a board where they, they reduce the swing weight in the tips with a certain construction. And um, so it, it would spin quite nicely, uh, but underfoot it would feel really nimble and actually feel really short until you then get this lift boost uh, in powder. So this is a great example of how a, a board that is actually fairly long can feel pretty nimble and short and, and you wouldn't think it's a tank. Now, this carve air thing, uh, that's a different story. It's, it's pretty much the opposite. Um, with this board here, K2 squeezed 1 meter 23 effective edge into a 1 meter 54 snowboard. So the whole idea, carve air, that board was a twin, no taper. Uh, I think it didn't even have setback. Um, so basically like a, a carving freestyle twin, right? That was the idea of that board. And um, one meter 23 edge 
as I just said, you would normally expect that on a 164. Now this is a 154 and um, they did the exact opposite, right? Like they, it's instead of extending the tips past the contact points, uh, they shrunk the tips. They really chopped off tip and tail, uh, kind of like border cross boards uh, used to look and actually still look if you look at companies like Kessler or Oxess or whatever in that world. Um, they all have these really stubby short kicks um, to, to, to maximize effective edge without having too much overall physical length of a board. Um, so with that Carver, that board was on top of that full camber. Now you have camber literally from contact point to contact point. One meter 23 uh, loaded under that camber uh, preload or tension, right? Um, what does that do for, for the perceived ride feel? That 154 felt like a fairly big board, not in the air because there's no swing weight. So again, very smart move from K2, um, a carving freestyle board um, to, to give it like that spinability, that agility um, when it's in the air by really reducing the tips, but therefore giving you this, this crazy long effective edge. Uh, so you're supported and have a lot of edge in the snow when you're carving. So that is a 154 and you would quite likely perceive that as a 160 or even, even more. So when we're talking about, well, what kind of board length do I need? Um, it's not as easy as just looking at the, the number that's, that's written on the board. And um, if you are kind of wondering, well, where am I? What is my actual board? Try to find a spec sheet of the board and uh, start with effective edge. If you can't actually find a spec sheet, what you want to do in that case is you simply take the board, put it onto its edge, um, and then the contact point, you take, you basically take the outside of the contact point, not the inside, um, make a little sharpie mark on your edge and do that on both sides, and then you just measure what's in between. And, and then at least, then at least you know, okay, I'm used to X amount of effective edge. So, and then when you buy your next board, you'll, you just compare, right? And see like, well, do I actually want this longer or do I want this shorter? Shorter is always, always uh, more agile, uh, is easier to drift and to skid, right? Like because there's less uh, contact, le less edge in the snow. So there's also less resistance when you actually uh, slide the board around, right? Now, however, when you don't slide the board around and you are carving the board, like you, you want to put it on edge and draw a clean line in the snow, um, more effective edge literally just equals more grip. So this carve air that I mentioned earlier, uh, perfect, right? You have a 154 and then 123 edge. Carving on that board was really fun for actually being, a, a, yeah, kind of like a freestyle twin. Um, so, so whenever we talk length, we have this uh, conversation about um, stability versus agility. And that is basically it. So if you have a reference length and a reference effective edge for yourself where you're like, yeah, this is what I'm used to and you want to change the feel, then uh, one parameter would be, okay, well, do I want it to feel more stable? Maybe I want something with more effective edge. Other factors that uh, make you perceive the board in a certain way are stiffness, in particular torsional stiffness, um, camber profile like rocker versus camber and everything in between, and also side cut radius. So the stiffness, um, if a board is relatively stiff for your weight, and you can't bend it properly, in particular if you have learned to steer the board uh, with its torsional flex, um, but the board doesn't give you that, it's too rigid between the feet, then you may perceive that board as kind of cumbersome, and that feeling of cumbersome often produces the sensation of, I need something shorter. Um, the opposite uh, works as well, if the board is really, really soft, although it's actually not that short, um, if I don't have enough support in the tail and that 
tail washes out on me all the time on like a back foot heavy cliff drop or, or in, a, in a hard turn on, on hard snow. Um, I can also think of like, ah, oh, is it not long enough or is it just the flex that bothers me here? Um, so yeah, just be careful with, uh, with your judgment there. Um, it's not always the written uh, length that is stated on the board that makes you feel a certain way. Side cut radius is fairly obvious. A board that uh, has a, a tighter radius, a, a shorter side cut radius, um, turns much quicker than a long radius and therefore uh, feels more agile and quicker to whip around, right? And then uh, camber versus rocker. Uh, I mentioned this earlier when I had the examples of the K2 boards. Uh, flat in the middle or rocker in the middle with the tips lifted off the snow always tends to pivot much easier than full camber or camber in the middle. And if you are on a board that is, let's say it is relatively long for what you're used to, but it's rockered or it's flat, you may not even notice that the board is a little bit longer. So um, whenever you think of changing board length, simply make sure you reflect the moment um, on whether it's really the physical length of the board that bugs you or any of those given design aspects that I just laid out. Now, if you walk into a shop or if you follow manufacturer recommendations, your board length will likely be determined by your weight. And that is a good thing because it is after all the rider weight that bends the board into a turn shape. In order to, to turn or to do anything on a snowboard, you're twisting it, you're bending it, you're flexing it. So your, your weight and uh, the board stiffness should go together. However, stiffness and length are two different things. In the old days, um, people were sized up simply by their height. So the recommendation was kind of like maybe to the neck for uh, freestyle and park riding and then uh, to the chin for all mountain riding and then to the mouth, up to the eyes, maybe uh, for free riding. Now, if you only take that, that is just as wrong as only taking uh, the rider weight and, and sizing the length by the board's um, rider weight range. And I'll give you two examples that outline that pretty well. First one is, think of this guy, maybe 5'7", not the tallest, um, 200 pounds, and he wants to buy a quick, agile, nimble park twin. Now, you look into the weight range of a given twin, and unfortunately, his 200 pounds put him onto the longest one. Let's say that's maybe for a park board, the longest they make is maybe a 160, maybe even a 162. Now, 5'7", likely not the longest legs, fairly narrow stance. He's on a 160 and he wants to whip it around uh, onto all these boxes in the park. Well, that's not a good idea, is it? That's a pretty big board for such a short person, although he has the weight. Um, opposite scenario, I've seen this one much, much more often. A person comes in, uh, six foot two, 160 pounds, um, and wants to buy like an all mountain board. Now, you're looking at the, the weight ranges and you quickly find that the 160 pounds with most uh, all mountain boards put him onto a, a 155. And um, now this is me talking from the perspective of living in Fernie, British Columbia, fairly steep, free ridey mountain um, and um, cliff drops and challenging terrain, deeper snow. Now this guy is like, okay, here you go, 150, uh, 160 pounds. Here's your 155 all mountain board. Now, the, the problem with this is that um, a given height of any object needs a given platform to stand on to be stable. If you take a, a tall water bottle and you give it a little tip on the side, it'll fall over. Now, as much as this guy might be great in getting all low, he cannot uh, really do much about being six foot two or six foot three. Um, if a person with that height comes off a cliff a little bit back foot heavy, there's no tail. Like he's, his center of mass is so high, he'll simply wipe out instantly. 
Um, so like that's just one example, right? Like the other thing is when you write steeps and um, you rely on, uh, let's call it braking performance of a board, like you need to slow yourself down. Um, a really short board obviously pushes less snow and therefore um, there's less resistance, right? So slowing yourself down in that kind of terrain on a really short board is sometimes quite difficult. Um, so, so there you see how riding style uh, and the terrain you ride um, have a huge impact on the board length you, you should pick. Now, how do you counter these two examples? The first guy, in my opinion, should be picking a board that is probably more like a 152-ish for his 5'7 for the park, but therefore pick something stiff or maybe even uh, go for something that is predominantly camber. So, so you know, you have this preload of the camber that supports his uh, weight a little bit more. The second guy uh, should probably buy a board that is more like in the 164, 165-ish length, but therefore choose something soft. Don't pick the export board, the, what, the Jones Carbon flagship. Uh, <laughs> in a 165. Um, that'll just be way too much board for his 160 uh, pounds, but he does need the length. So you, long story short, um, this shows you that the, the just go by weight range or just go by the old method of sizing the board up to your, your body height, none of them can stand alone. And um, to find the perfect board, there is no one length that will do it all for you. I recently experienced firsthand how off that can be when you just go by a weight range. So I went on to, just for the fun of it, I went onto the Burton homepage and picked the board that kind of speaks to me. It's the Burton Cartographer, intermediate, I'd say free ride inspired, all mountain directional shape. So you, on the Burton page, they have this little tool, uh, find your size with, with each uh, board, uh, which is actually pretty cool. It's not a general recommendation, but, but you have this button with every board you can choose. So I was like, well, that's a cool little gadget here. Uh, let's see what they put me on. So all they asked me was my boot size and my weight. And they spat out that I should be on the 149 or the 154. Now, the first thing that is really interesting about that is that they obviously didn't consider my boot size or they didn't consider um, that maybe I can actually tip a board on edge because uh, the 149 with a, I think, 250 waist uh, on a 10 and a half boot is, uh, that'll be challenging. And, <laughs> uh, and even the 154 would be way too narrow. So um, ability level is a huge, huge thing here, right? Um, you, can't, you can't simply go by weight range and, and forget about all the other metrics. This very uh, example explains why I am used to longer boards. Because back in the day, there were no uh, short fats and all these uh, cool things that you can get these days. And I realized fairly early that I needed a wider board because I was always drawn to carving. I just love being on edge. And... Um, so boot drag became a thing pretty early. And back in the day, going wider always meant going longer. There, there wasn't that many, there weren't that many options like, oh, the 158 normal and the 158 wide. And then that wasn't actually wide enough. So I'd be on a 162. So, so I've actually always ridden boards around a 160, 162 with my now, what, 138 pounds. Um, and with that, you get used to uh, a certain uh, performance as well. Like I got used to the benefits that I get out of the stability uh, in a longer board, right? Like you, you, you have more platform to move fore aft to, to properly weight the nose without going over the bars and to also like get onto the back foot to come out of a turn or uh, take a bigger cliff and be able to actually stomp a slightly back foot heavy landing without wiping out. And, and when you've gotten used to such a thing and then you go, well, let's just try what the manufacturers recommend and you jump like I jump 
on a 152 or something, I just feel like a fish out of water. Like so many, so many features that this length gives me are, are simply missing, regardless of uh, the stiffness of that given 152, right? Like you cannot, you cannot substitute um, the, the length with simply making the board stiffer. First of all, it's, it's going to become kind of, yeah, well, inflexible, right? Like uh, hard to maneuver. Um, but then also like if there is no tip and tail, there is no tip and tail. It doesn't matter how stiff this thing is. And um, it, it is a little bit too easy, too simple to simply go by weight range. So I decided to line up a couple of my boards to simply show you that there is no such thing as the one right length. This is my uh, short fat powder fish, uh, Stranda mackerel, super fun. That's a 153, right? So I'm standing tall right now. Um, 153, that's pretty short for Lars. Um, it's a little whip. It's a little uh, powder surf wake board type thing. Super quick off the tail. There's not much mass. There's not much effective edge. It's probably around a meter. Um, so that is just like, yeah, it's a blast to, to whip around on a really good powder day. When it's choppy, it's a little, I like a little bit more length. Um, and when I'm uh, riding bigger lines uh, of some of the head walls here, then I like a bit more tail. Or uh, uh, if there's cliffs around, I definitely want more tail. Uh, this is like a, a luxury board, as in I don't need this in my quiver, but it is really fun to have. Uh, then my daily driver is a 162. So this board is like, I can do anything on this board. That helps me on a deep power day, on a choppy day, on a groomer day. This thing is just, it just does the job. The 162 is a length that I've uh, gotten so comfortable with, almost regardless um, <clears throat> of the shape and purpose of the board it's just a it's just a good length for me and then we we step into carving and then my kind of the daily driver carver uh, is a 170 but this board has the edge of uh, a 185 like if this thing was whoopa if this thing actually had a tail like a tail kick and a little more nose because it doesn't have very much effective edge and it's about here so that's not that much nose if you give this a little bit more tip, then all of a sudden that's a 185. And then uh, Stranda Pipeliner, this is actually a 185 or 187. Uh, this is a prototype. This thing has 1 meter 53 effective edge. So the physical length of this mackerel is literally the edge of this thing. And then this guy uh, is the Cheater 200. This board is 200 centimeters long. And effective edge on this guy is uh, over 170. <laughs> so uh, the amount of this uh, physical length is just edge on this yellow monster. And you can imagine that this board, I cannot take this out on a day where sliding turns is even an option. Um, this thing is so long, the tips are so far away from my feet that sliding this board around through like a bumpy afternoon uh, groomer chop field is, a, is very exhausting and completely dysfunctional. So this thing comes out maybe four days a season when I feel like ah, I'm just gonna go for five laps and I, I just ride perfectly pristine corduroy, mostly on those really cold days when it's firm. Um, it's a blast, you cannot I cannot get the feeling that I get on this board on anything else. Like putting this on edge, 12 meter radius, uh, compressing the center, you're surrounded by this effective edge. And the, the stability that you gain out of this, like small movements fore aft, do nothing to the board. Like you're just, you're just so stable in there. You can literally just sit in your turn. And, and um, every single board, gives me a certain vibe, a certain feel. And I'm not trying to say everybody should have uh, eight different snowboards for a different feel, because um, that's pretty much uh, the most luxurious way I can spend a winter. But there is such a thing as picking your board by desired outcome. 
simply going by weight range the way it is promoted these days, I don't think is a good idea. So there you have it. Next time you pick a board, be a little more reflected. Like think about what you actually want to do with a board, how you actually ride, where you actually ride and what you use it uh, the most for, whether you build a quiver or whether you are that I need one board to do it all kind of guy. And, and think of the other attributes like a, a, a tight turning radius can make a board feel whippy, although it's actually rather long. Um, a rocker profile will be feeling a little bit looser and a little bit turnier, like a skiddier um, right between the feet and therefore a longer rocker board actually doesn't feel all that long and then vice versa, right? Like a, a strong camber profile um, on, a, on, a, on a size that is seemingly rather short for you might actually feel like a lot of board. So like ask yourself, what feel you want from your board. And then hopefully you can find uh, ideally a shop with experienced staff that have uh, demoed a whole bunch themselves um, to help you really find what suits you. Speaking of myself, like working in snowboard retail uh, over the last 11 years, I, I kept the list because I'm a bloody nerd. Uh, <laughs> I kept the list of all the boards that I tried. It's about 140 snowboards that I've ridden. And um, it's, it's remarkable to, to experience the subtle differences and also the large differences between boards that, you know, in the shop, they kind of seem pretty similar or on paper sometimes they even seem pretty similar. But then depending on how the core profile has been milled, where it's stiff, where it's soft, you get a totally different uh, vibe. So the, the, the fact that I can actually ride a two meter long snowboard is all in the flex of this thing. This whole nose here is pretty soft. So when I launch onto my front foot with my 138 pounds, that thing still bends. And um, so yeah, like you cannot conclude from a certain length alone that it's gonna be a board that does this. Um, ask the right questions. And hopefully you find uh, somebody that gives you great advice. All right. Uh, up until then, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Share the love with your friends. Uh, get the notifications. Super important. Always ring this notification bell. And uh, hopefully you get to snowboard a lot. We have, uh, it is the end of February. And yeah, here in Fernie, we have about six weeks left. And I'm looking forward to more power. It's currently snowing. See you out there. Bye-bye.